Good morning, everybody. Hey there in the back, Brent and Kayla. How are you guys doing? Hey, everybody. I don't even know each day to day who's here because people park in different places. It's not like in a church building where people have their like favorite seat. We're going to start out with a little song called I Am Free. I'm so glad we got freedom in Jesus. The blind will see, through you the mute will sing, through you the dead will rise, through you our hearts will pray, through you the darkness flees, through you my heart screams, I am free, I am free. sets free and I am free Father, it's who you are, it's who you are, 
It's who you are and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in can hardly speak peace so unexplainable I, I can hardly think as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still into love 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 your give a big shout out to my kiddos back here really really proud of them you know I told them we were really gonna have to work hard today because some of our instrumentalists were out I haven't had the work and Isabel's gone today and uh, I think they did a really good job so super proud of you oh they escaped he's running from the running from the congratulations one more thing I want to do before I get started in the word today it's on um, I want to say a big happy birthday on Wednesday to my mom, who's like 29, 39, something like that. And uh, I would like to also congratulate my grandmother, who was there on that day and somehow involved with the birth of my mom. So it's a good week. I'm really, uh, really thankful to have the mom that I have. And, on one of my mom's birthdays, she gave birth to my brother. My brother was born on her birthday. i uh, yet to be determined whether that was a good birthday present or not. I would have told you growing up that was not a good birthday present, but I think she would say she was glad about it. Today, we are finishing up that series on the secret of being blessable. And everybody wants to be blessed. And one thing that's carried us through this series is this idea that character creates capacity. Character creates capacity. For blessings we have a father God who wants to bless us who desires to bless us even more than we desire to be blessed now somebody's gonna say well that, I don't know if that's right because sometimes I don't feel so blessed I don't feel like you know if God wants to bless me what why isn't he just doing it well I bet we're all a lot more blessed than we know but I'll say this there have been times in my life where it felt like things were sort of going good like Hey, this is a good time, a blessed time, and, and it's like the blessings were... You ever had those times where it's starting to go good and you get a little nervous, like, wait a minute, it's going too good for a while. What's about to happen? And then something does. There have been times where it felt like like God was blessing me and things were going good, and then it, it like bumped up against a lid, like there was a lid on my blessing, something keeping it from going any higher, and it kind of went back down. And I've wondered, what is that? Why would there be a lid on blessings? What is the lid on blessings? And and through the years, I've 
when I'm in the middle of it, it's like when you're in the middle of a situation, it's hard to understand it when you're right in the middle of it. And I'm like, what's going on? I don't understand this, Lord. Things were going good for once, and now things have gone weird. I don't, I don't understand. I don't like this. But kind of looking back through the years, I start to see a pattern that when the blessings kind of bumped up against the lid, I think I know what the lid is now. The lid was my character. <laughs> It was bumping up against the limits of my character. And if God were to bless me beyond the limits of my character, I would have made a mess of it. It would not have been a good thing. And of course we say, well, if the Lord just wanted to bless me with everything, of course it's going to be a good thing. Well, think about this. There are blessings that if you would receive them as fully as the Lord would want to give you and you're not ready for them, it might ruin you. Now just imagine you know someone who's got a serious drug addiction problem yep a person with a serious drug addiction the worst thing in the world for them would be to come into a pile of money like if someone who was seriously drug addicted badly I mean on some hardcore stuff and they should win the lottery that would probably be the death of them because suddenly they'd have unlimited money to feed that addiction it would it would not help them it would actually hasten their destruction now are there things for you and I that God would like to bless us with but if he was to bless us as fully as he'd like to when we don't have the character to handle it it might just be the destruction of us and i've seen some places in my life that if the lord had taken me any further than i was i really would have made a mess of things so man i just i i, I, I want to be blessed y'all want to be blessed i want to be as blessed as i can and for my blessings to not wreck me so my prayers have kind of changed instead of just praying lord please bless me i'm starting to pray more lord please make me the kind of person that you can trust with blessings. Lord, make me the kind of person that you don't have to hold back any good thing because of my immaturity. Lord, make me a blessable person because if we want to be blessed, we should probably seek to be blessable. And in God's economy, that means growing in character, growing in your, your spiritual and uh, moral maturity. It means growing up. Character is who we really are on the inside. We live in a world where you can hide who you are. You can take pictures with the filters, you know, and make yourself look like anything or, or anybody. There's even some of those Snapchat filters that even if you ain't good looking, they'll make you so good looking. I would not want to be trying to date in the year 2020 because you'd never know what anybody really looks like if you just saw them on these filtered pictures. You know, they might look very, very different than what you saw but i might guarantee you they don't have puppy dog ears if they're talking to you on snapchat so you know that's that's fake but god sees through all the fakeness that we put out in the world we cannot hide who we truly are from god our inmost character is who we really are with no fake in it no filters right in the heart of us when we think nobody's looking god sees we can fool the entire world but god sees into our hearts now Am I promising you that if you'll grow in character, all your wildest dreams will come true and there will be a unicorn waiting for you on your porch because you always wanted a unicorn? And if you just grow in character, God will bless you with that. No, I can't make you that promise. But I will promise you this. If you become the kind of person, if you grow into the kind of person that God naturally seeks to bless, more likely you're going to be blessed. And those blessings may not look like what you imagine, but they will be the good and right things. So here we are. On this beautiful Sunday in August, isn't it a lovely, beautiful day? And I've got to talk about things that are controversial, fun, right? Ah, but of course, we live in strange times. 2020 is a weird time, y'all. Everything is controversial. If I were to look in the sky and say the sky is blue, somebody would argue with me and say, well, it's not really blue. There's clouds up there, too. And what do you mean by the color blue? Does that mean you favor the male gender over the female gender? Are you saying blue skies are better than pink skies? What are you saying? Are you saying blue is the color of a certain political party? No, I don't like that party. Someone would argue over me like that, that the sky is blue. It's weird times, man. It's hard to be a communicator of anything in times where everything is so politicized and everything you say and do, somebody is going to give you a hard time for it. So I'm going to give you a warning up front that some of what I'm going to say might seem a little controversial, but... If God put it on my heart, I better say it. Now, that's not to say that I don't care what people think about me. I do care. I probably care more than I should. 
but I'll be 100% honest with you. As much as I love y'all, I'm more scared of the Lord than I am of y'all. Just do me one favor. Will you do me a favor? We're friends, right? At this point, until after this message, maybe. We're friends. If something I say today makes you mad or upset, don't just bull up and be mad. Actually, think about why it makes you mad. And, you know, let the Lord work through that. It might be that I, I'm wrong in what I have to say, and you can come and tell me. Say, hey, Michael, here's here's from the Bible where I know that you're, you're mistaken on this. And, hey, if you can show me in the Bible that I'm wrong, I'm definitely going to change my opinion. Because the Bible trumps anything that I'm going to say today. But if you can't find in the Bible where I'm wrong, maybe think about it. And do me one more favor. Can you do me one more favor? If I do make you really mad and you see me in the parking lot after service, don't run me over, okay? Because i got to preach again this evening and it's going to make it really hard if I'm squished under your vehicle. So we're going to read in the book of James. Um, so you can be finding that. Today we're going to talk about this question. What does it mean to be authentically religious? Authentically religious. Now, when I say the word religion or religious, automatically some folks are going to tense up at that. And, and there have been times where I would tense up at that too, and maybe I still do. Because religion can kind of elicit some uncomfortable feelings sometimes. I've heard a lot of people say, they say, well, I believe in God, but I don't like organized religion. And there have been some times I might have said that too. But if we don't like organized religion, what do we prefer? Disorganized religion? Sometimes I feel kind of disorganized. Maybe we got that going. But what we really mean when we say, I don't like, disor I don't like organized religion, probably what we mean is somewhere along the way we were really disappointed by some religious system or some religious people. That's usually what we mean. That somewhere along the way we got our hearts broke by a church or by some church people or some religious people. Some people who practiced, preached one thing and practiced another. That's usually what we mean when we say we don't care for organized religion is we encountered some inauthentic religion in one form or another that somebody or some system, some church or some group they, they expected one thing of other people, but they really didn't live it out. Inauthentic religion, and, and that's, that's a problem. Today I want to talk about what authentic religion means. Now, authentic is like one of those buzzwords. It's kind of big in our culture right now. We live in a world that is so very fake most of the time that almost every image you see has been altered, and, and every story you hear has been spun by somebody. And it's like in a world where everything is fake, people want to know what's real. So, interestingly, a lot of big corporations and celebrities spend a lot of money to try to convince people that they're authentic, that they're for real. Now, and they don't seem to get the irony of that. To me, if you're trying to fool people into thinking you're for real, if you're trying to fake people into thinking you're real, that doesn't seem like authenticity to me. That's like the opposite of authenticity. But what do I know? I'm not a market person. You know, I'm not a marketer. But... Uh, it's like a fake out. I wish I could say that every moment of every day in my life was perfectly, perfectly authentic. I wish I could tell you all that, but I can't. I'm just like, I'm like most people, you know, there's times that I don't live up to what God has called me to be and to do as a, as a person, as a dad, as a father, even as a, as a pastor. I just, you know, sometimes I try very hard to, to preach the word of God. Sometimes I don't live up to it, even though I'm, I'm trying most of the time. Um, so if you if you want to have a pastor who always gets everything right and always has the perfect thing to say and and like is so polished and always on and, and is never going to mess up, I'm definitely not your guy. But if if you here's what maybe we can do. Maybe we can learn and grow together. How about that? See what we're trying to do is recreate church. We're not trying to be that church where everybody looks perfect and it's polished. I can guarantee you, you will not experience polished church services. Even when we're able to move back inside, you won't get sort of that polished, beautiful production. We probably won't ever have like any laser lights or smoke machines or anything like that. Part of the, I have asthma. I don't need no smoke machine in there. But, you know, what we're trying to create is an environment where you can really be yourself, warts and all, flaws and all. You know, one of the things that we say in our, in our materials, we say we are a safe place to be real. That you can be real about where you're at 
and you can be real about your struggle. Here, here's one of the things that we say. You have permission to struggle. You don't have to fake that everything's okay in your life. You have permission to struggle, but not permission to struggle alone. We don't want you to fight your battles alone. We want to help you fight, fight alongside you and be with you. So you're you're fighting your fight, you're, you're struggling against it, and we're going to come and be beside you and help you with that. You don't have to act like everything's perfect and good in your life. Quite the opposite. You can be real about what you're going through, and we'll be there with you. That's what we're trying to do. That's what we're trying to do for each other. That's why I encourage you guys, right now when we can't really physically be so close together, you know, try to keep in touch as best you can. You know, call people, text people, message them, do whatever. You know, keep in touch and show them that you care. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to read in the book of James. James was the first pastor of the first church. We find his letter to Christians there near the end of the New Testament. And James did not pull any punches. James, well, he tells it like it is, and he does it pretty uncomfortably sometimes. It's kind of like a gut punch. Uh, the book of James is. It hits hits us where we don't want to be hit. And today, we're going to be talking about, or James is going to be mentioning kind of a, a sore spot. He's going to call people out for claiming to be religious, but not living that out in the way they relate to people. Claiming to be religious, but not really showing religion by being positively involved in the lives of other people. So we're going to be in James chapter 1, verse uh, 26, verse 27. I'm going to finish out the chapter. It goes like this, if anyone among you thinks he's religious and does not bridle his own tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in the trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. I'm going to pause right there and pray for us, Heavenly Father. Lord. There's some things that we need to hear that's going to be uncomfortable, and I pray you'll open our hearts to them. You'll work through them and bring us out on the other side, ready to serve you and to love others more faithfully. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, he starts out with that line, if any of you thinks he is religious, and James specifically chooses the word religious here instead of faith. You know, faith is the inside belief, and religion, at least in one definition, is the outside application of those beliefs. So he's talking here about the, the outward... Um, public practice of faith, religion. In some sense, gathering on a Sunday morning is a, is a religious practice, though we want to be more than just checking our religious boxes. So James is here talking about religion as the outward expression of faith. He says, if anyone thinks they're religious... And then he's going to follow it up with something a little difficult. He's really going to talk about people who who want to have the appearance of being religious or at least morally superior, but they don't really back it up in the way that they treat people. Now, have you ever met somebody? I bet you have. Have you ever met somebody who could talk a big talk religiously, who could sing the hymns and, and memorize the verses and, and look like just the best Christian you've ever met, but then you see how they treat people, and you're like, do they even know Jesus? I mean, Jesus wouldn't do people like this. You met some people like that? I probably had some moments where, where people wondered that about me. I try so hard to represent him good wherever I go. But, man, there's a lot of people in this world, and we might be guilty of it sometimes, of being able to talk big religion but not back it up when we actually interact with people. Okay. If we were inside and I was able, I would probably get you to show hands. I'm not going to ask you to beep or anything. I just want you to kind of answer to yourself. What would you say is the most religious time in America. When's the most religious time in America? Well, for me, during football season, it's when my team's about to kick the field goal that will win the game. It's not football season yet. Uh, for kids, when they're actually in school, probably the most religious time is when the test is being handed out because, I mean, even if you're not sure there's a God up there and they're, the teacher's handing out a test, you're sort of lobbing something up there. So, Lord, if, if you, to whom it may concern... I got my history test here, and I'd like something. But for the most part, still in America, the most religious time is Sunday morning, is right now. Because still more than any other time, that's when religious services are going on. Not just Christian religious services, but a lot of different things. So 
if Sunday morning is the most religious time, so to speak, when would the most irreligious time, the most anti-religious time be? Somebody might say, well, that would be Friday night, Pastor, because everybody gets paid on Friday, and they spend some of that paycheck, and, and we go have a good time on Friday night. Well, maybe that's so, but if you've ever worked in a restaurant, you would probably tell me that the most irreligious time in America is Sunday afternoon. Why? Because all the church people go to the restaurants, or we used to before this COVID thing. You remember back when you could like, go into a restaurant and buy food and eat food? Wasn't that fun? We kind of missed that. We didn't know how good we had it. But typically, when we're not in the middle of a pandemic, Sunday afternoon is when all the church folks go to lunch. And I've never worked in a restaurant. I've never been a waiter. But my wife was a waitress for years, and a lot of my friends and family have worked in food service and been in restaurants, and they say that one of the worst times of the week to work at a restaurant is on Sunday afternoon because all them church people come in, and unfortunately should not be this way, but church folks have a reputation of being rude and entitled and just mean and, and all of that, and they're like, that should not be that way. It's a little bit of a running joke. Some of you are kind of new to this Recreate Circle. One of my jokes is that if you leave from Recreate Church Services and you go to a restaurant, you and you're going to be mean to anybody at the restaurant, you better not let them know you came from here. And if you're wearing like one of our t-shirts that say Recreate Church or a hat, you better be extra nice to people. Or if you're going to have to be mean to somebody, you better go change your shirt, okay? Go to the bathroom, turn your shirt inside out, then go chew out whoever you're chewing out. Or better yet, just be nice to people the whole time. Because as Recreate Church, we are about something so different. We're trying to change the story for church. There's so many people around who have gotten discouraged with church and discouraged with what we're trying to do here because they have had encounters with people who claim to be religious but don't know how to treat folks right. We are changing that. We are seeking to change that every day. That's what we're trying to do. We're changing that. I want you to be a part of that. Okay, so I'm telling you, don't, don't be rude to people after church. And we let out a little earlier than some churches, so you don't have to fight the crowds here. That's one of the advantages of Recreate Church. 10 a.m. services means you're probably going to be out of here not too long after 11, so you beat the other church services there. And you go in there, and if you're wearing a Recreate hat, you better tip real good, okay? They know you're coming from here because we want to let them know that we care. So appearing religious but not living out the kindness, compassion, and humility modeled by Jesus, man, that's that's got to change. If we're going to show up on Sunday morning and claim we know Jesus, we're going to have to show Jesus on Sunday afternoon. So now he gets to the a little deeper. He says, if anyone claims they're religious and does not bridle their tongue, their religion is useless. Bridle, that's something you use on a horse, right? I mean, I'm, I've ridden horses, but I'm not really a horse person. Maybe some of y'all are. A bridle is the the thing you attach to the horse's head to point it in the right direction to get it go where you want it to go. And it's very important that a horse be kept under control and led because a horse is a very large and potentially very dangerous animal. A horse will kill you. If you crawl, it can kill you. Did you know that you're 20 times more likely to be killed by a horse than a shark? Now some of y'all horse people are starting to rev your engines and point that car at me. I know how it is. I'm picking on your horses. No, horses are great. You just have to know how to handle them. That's probably the first thing a horse person will tell you. Is you need to know how to handle a horse because if you don't, you're likely to get hurt. A horse has to be trained well and has to be controlled well. That's what a bridle is for. You control the horse. James says we need to put a bridle on our tongues, on our mouths, in other words, on our words because our words have the power to, well, Proverbs 18, 21 says, Life and death is in the power of the tongue. The words we use can create life or create death. I'd say most of the stuff that you've got involved in your life that got you in trouble, your mouth was a whole lot of what got you in trouble. Yeah. Thank you for your honesty right over here. And you might also say a lot of the good things that have come your way, you said the right things at the right time. If you have a spouse or significant other, chances are you said the right thing at the right time because if you hadn't, you would not have them today. 
You know, I, I managed to be smooth for like a whole year and snagged Katie. Say a little prayer for Katie. She's not feeling too good today. But somehow I managed to be smooth enough to snag her. I, I haven't been able to sustain that. But for a short period of time, I said, at least said the right things at the right time. Our words are very important. If we claim to follow Jesus, we got to bridle our tongues, James says. If we don't control our mouths, then that it's like it invalidates our claim. If we say, you know, I'm religious, I worship the Lord, and we use our mouths to run people down and hurt them, or we just lose it on people, it, it's like our claim of religion is useless. Have you ever heard anybody say, or maybe you said it yourself, when you're so mad and you're just about to give somebody an earful, you say, I'm about to lose my religion. I'm about to lose my religion on that person. If they don't get it straightened out, Anybody ever been on, like, hold with Comcast Internet? That'll make you lose your religion right there. Carolyn knows what I'm talking about. Yes. And uh, we say that, but it's not so far from the truth. Our mouths will destroy our credibility faster than just about anything. So interesting. We live in a time where social media has really been pervasive for, like, 10 years now. We've had a decade of celebrities and and people politicians posting stuff on social media and like 10 years later somebody will pick out some old thing that someone put out there and that kind of ruins their political career very interesting is the problem is the problem the social media side or is the problem the mouth the words the words yeah of course it's the words that can do damage i just want to say jesus people we need to be really careful not to trade away our credibility when it's not worth it. Because we have the greatest message in the history of the world that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to earth as a human being to live among us, to live a perfect, sinless life, to die a sacrificial death on the cross in our place, to be buried and resurrected three days later so that anybody who believes in him should not perish but ever have everlasting life. Man, that's good news. Why would we, having such good news as that, mess up our credibility to communicate that message by a bunch of trash talk especially these days it's so easy to get into like political trash talk these are such politically messy times i, I i'm not going to ask you to beep your horn to like show that you're tired of the political craziness in our world because y'all probably blow me right off this concrete pad because i think we're all pretty tired of it i don't care kind of where you fall in the spectrum we're just tired of it so as, as Jesus people, we need to be careful that we don't mess up our credibility with our mouths. Because our mouth is what we use, by and large, to communicate the gospel. So if we use our mouths to communicate, you know, trash talk, it, 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 give, it takes away our opportunity. Katie went to the doctor this week as a, a doctor in a, in a larger town where she goes, part of a university hospital. And uh, I'm so thankful she got a good checkup, praise the Lord. Sorry she's feeling bad today, Un not the same issue. But she got a good checkup, so that was nice. But she heard a story in the waiting room. You know, you know how it is. You're sitting in the waiting room. You're trying to mind your own business, and there's somebody over there talking loudly. So there was a couple of women in the waiting room wearing masks, thankfully. So was Katie, talking loudly. And uh, one lady turned to her friend and said, You know, I think I need to start hanging out with more atheists. And that's... Well, that's, that's a strange thing to say. And her friend said, well, why, why do you say that? And the lady looked at her and said, well, all my Christian friends are being so ugly about all this coronavirus thing. I think I just need to start hanging out with more atheists. Maybe they'd be nicer. I'm like, ah, that story broke Katie's heart. And she told, told me and it broke my heart. So now I've told you and you're, we're all heartbroken together. It's like, man. Is that, is that the way the world sees us, is just the people who are being ugly right now? I don't think that's what's in our hearts, at least I hope not. So we just need to remember, man, it's frustrating, is it not? The whole coronavirus thing is frustrating. You don't know who to believe or what to believe, and you know, you're trying to do your best. I, I'll be honest, I carry a mask around all the time. I'm trying to be safe because I have a beautiful wife with a lot of health issues that I want to make sure she doesn't catch it, and a lot of family members too. But it's kind of hard to know what to believe, and it's kind of easy to get really bent out of shape and... I just, I just don't want, us, don't want us to be those people who give people reason to say, hey, I don't want to be around Christians. I'd rather be around the, the atheists. If we're going to win the unbelieving world to the gospel of Jesus Christ, we're going to have a harder time doing it if we've been trash talking.
even even about important things. So if inauthentic religion is evidenced by not using our words in the right way, not controlling our mouths, what is authentic religion evidenced by? Well, he says in verse 27, pure religion, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Now, he uses two synonymous terms, pure and undefiled, to really emphasize and set apart true faith as something different than the appearance of religion. Because we know you can appear to be religious, but not be truly pure and undefiled. We can, uh, and he says here, don't dismantle your claims to be religious by using your words carelessly, but demonstrate your true faith by, well, he says, caring for widows and orphans. Vulnerable people is what he's talking about. Now, he specifies those two groups of people, widows and orphans. Those aren't the only vulnerable people in the world, but for most of human history, widows and orphans have been particularly vulnerable, okay, to exploitation. Now, okay, I'm about to poke the bear, and I don't poke the bear unnecessarily uh, because it's talking about widows here. Um, I just want to be very plain and very clear. These days, I'm so glad we live in a time where women have so many more rights than they used to. You know, some of y'all can remember when, when women didn't have as many rights, even as they do now. And, and we realize here that James is talking about women as being very, uh, being very vulnerable. And some of y'all might say, well, I'd like them to think that I'm a vulnerable person and try to come in and get me. There's some of you ladies I wouldn't mess with. You know, Lucy back there, she might be like this tall, but I know she could kick my butt. I'm not even going to try to fight with Lucy. I don't, I wouldn't have a chance. She's feisty. But that's kind of, our world has changed. Back when, when James wrote, it was different. I know today that oh, all y'all ladies are strong, independent women who don't need no man. But back in ancient times, women had very few rights. And when James wrote, uh, women were particularly vulnerable to being exploited. And a, a woman who did not have a man advocating for her was in real trouble, was in real trouble. If she didn't have a husband to kind of stick up for her, she could be taken advantage of. So he's talking here about widows whose husband has passed away, and particularly widows who did not have a prospect of being remarried if they were a bit older. And he says widows are, are very vulnerable to exploitation. Now, even to this day, even though women's rights have been lifted up, and by the way, you know who was for women's rights? Jesus. He actually treated women very kindly for his culture. And the Apostle Paul explained to us later on that God doesn't look down here and treat men and women differently. He, he says there's no male or female Jew or Greek, slave or free. You know, he, he doesn't really worry as much about those distinctions as we do when it comes to how you treat people with respect. So James, James is saying here, look out for widows to this day women are still exploited and used and abused at a rate that is appalling, utterly appalling, and it should not be. He says, look out for orphans, okay? An orphan is a child without parents, technically speaking. So if you think of an orphan, you might be thinking of children living in an orphanage or living in a group home or maybe kids um, living on the streets. But I would say to you that there's some more vulnerable children too that might be living with family members but are still pretty vulnerable because there's, you know, maybe some serious substance abuse in that home. Maybe there's some verbal or physical or psychological abuse in that home. Um, you know, maybe there's some serious mental illness in that home and the kids effectively don't have anybody sticking up for them and advocating for them. And those kids are very vulnerable. Children are extremely vulnerable, especially those who are in bad living situations. All right, I'm going to shock you with a statistic. Some of you already know this. Some of you haven't heard this. Some of you are wondering, why isn't anybody talking about this? Every single year in the United States of America, 1.2 million children are trafficked. Human trafficking. Let's call it what it is. It's modern-day slavery. 1.2 million children are sold, bought and sold in the United States in forced labor, um, for sexual exploitation, for things like that. 1.2 million. That is eight times more people than have died in the United States from the coronavirus this year. 
every single year 1.2 million children. Can you believe that? That is so messed up. 1.2 million children exploited. And, and children from people groups of color are exploited at an even higher rate. Um, African Americans and Hispanic Americans um, make up the vast majority of those that are trafficked. I mean, it's messed up. This is the biggest human rights crisis in the modern world. Human trafficking. And yet, you will never see anything on the news about it. Have you noticed that? 1.2 million children bought and sold in the United States. Most of those online. And yet, where's the outcry? Where's the media coverage? Now, if 1.2 million kids can be bought and sold in the United States every year, and you never hear anything on the news about that, here's my little conspiracy theory. I try not to be a conspiracy theorist, but if this happens so much, and you never hear anything on the news about it, somebody's covering that up. Somebody's suppressing that story. So Jesus people need to be talking about that. Human trafficking is a real issue in the United States of America in the year 2020. Slavery might have been outlawed in the 1860s, but it is still going on to this very day. And most of those people who are being exploited are children. Children and young women are being exploited in this human trafficking. It is so sick. Historically, Christian people have been on the forefront of standing up for those who are especially vulnerable to exploitation. You know, when it was Jesus' people who created the first orphanages and hospitals and social support systems for people who were in bad shape and couldn't take care of themselves. It was Jesus' people who did that. You know, it wasn't governments who did that. It was, it was Jesus' people. We've got to be the ones that will speak up for this. We have a special call to help people who are being systematically exploited. Of course, we live in crazy times everything is so messy when you stand up for any cause today somebody's going to tell you how that cause is not the right cause to stand up for it's a messy time everything is so politicized every word you say and every action you take will be twisted by somebody but that doesn't let us off the hook it really doesn't you know so what do we do so what do we do now some folks would make christianity primarily about social justice what about that? Um, some people will treat Christianity as though political reform is the primary goal of the church. But the Bible does not bear that out. Whatever you do into the car, Alexis, stop. Turn off the key. I may need a jump start after the service. I have a bad feeling they just killed my battery. So anybody got any jumper cables? We'll take care of that in a little bit. <laughs> so where was I? Oh, yes. The Bible does not bear out the idea that the, the primary purpose of the church is political reform. You know, Jesus, he spoke out against the wrong things in the culture around him. Absolutely. He stood up against crooked systems. He absolutely did. He spoke up for the downtrodden. But I'll tell you, he did not become a politician. They tried to make Jesus a politician. Have you ever read that in the New Testament? They tried to make Jesus into a politician. They tried to get him to declare himself the ruler, and lead a revolt, a political revolt against Rome. But he steadfastly refused to do that. Jesus was not a political leader. He was a spiritual leader. He didn't start a political movement. He started a spiritual movement. That's what he did. Not a politician. Otherwise, it would have been just another uprising in the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was full of uprisings. And if Jesus had just been a political leader, it would have been just another political uprising. But that's not what he did. Here's the thing, though. Jesus started a spiritual movement that was going to have repercussions in all parts of society. It was going to change the social system around them. And it was going to result in, hopefully, some justice being brought to people who didn't have justice. So listen carefully. Remember I told you that I was going to be controversial today? This may be the part where we get a little bit controversial, okay? If social justice is not the gospel, it's not. And salvation doesn't come through political change. Um, it's more than just a tool for liberating the socially oppressed. The gospel is about new life. It's about redemption in Jesus. It's about being brought into the family of God. And if we manage to 
politically free everybody and bring equality, we haven't finished the job. Our true job is to bring salvation to people, to, to bring salvation to souls. If we set the whole world free politically and don't set their hearts free spiritually, we've missed it. Okay, but here's the other part. If we really know Jesus, it's going to impact the society around us. While the primary purpose of the church is not to promote social justice, or not to create social justice, we should be seeking justice for people. I told you I was going to step on some toes today, and ruffle some feathers, and I may pay a price for this. We'll see. It should change the way we treat people and view people. Christian conviction means we got to recognize problems and do something about it. It means we can't stick our head in the sand about things that are going on in the world around us. So what do we do? How do we change the world around us? Well, some people think that if you just change your profile picture on Facebook, you've made a difference. Well, I don't know. So people say, well, you know, I'm going to I'm going to go off on this person that I know who's in the wrong. Is that going to make a difference? Probably not. If I stand back and tell people how they're wrong, maybe they'll get straightened out. Is that going to fix the problem? Probably not. If I gather with a bunch of people and demand that change happens, is that going to fix it? Well, I'm not so sure. If I perpetrate violence and burn down the world, is that going to fix it? Probably not. See, America has gotten used to this idea that if you see something wrong, you're just supposed to yell about it until somebody fixes it. It's kind of, it's kind of like, you know, there's a mess in the room, and you're sitting there with your feet up, say, somebody needs to clean up that mess. Somebody needs to clean up that mess. Anybody going to clean up that mess? Somebody needs to clean up that mess. And you just yell until someone cleans up the mess. America's got used to that idea of creating change is yell until somebody else cleans up the mess. Or if you don't think there's a mess, yell at the people who are yelling about the mess until they shut up about the mess. You know? And we think that's the way you solve things. America's got used to that idea is the way to solve things is to, to yell until the mess gets cleaned up or people shut up about the mess. But neither one of those work very well. We're trying that. Those are bad solutions. James did not tell us that the way to show your religion is to change your profile picture or to raise awareness or anything like that. What did he actually say? He said, go, go to the widows and the orphans. Visit the widows and the orphans. That's what he said do. He didn't say change your, you know, profile picture to say I support widows and orphans. No, he said go to them. Go and physically get involved, get your hands dirty, and do something. See, we seem unable to understand that God might be using us to fix the mess. He might be calling us to be the ones who create a different future, to do something that's real and actually hands-on to help people who are vulnerable. See, Recreate the world is kind of in a mess. And I know nobody wants to deal with the mess. In my house, I'm the dishwasher, okay? I'm the one who washes dishes. Now, some of you are the dishwasher in your house. Bless you, my friend. It's no fun being the dishwasher. You see, some of you are awesome, and y'all wash the dishes right away. You wash them right away. Like, I'm going to wash this. My wife is this way. God bless her. She washes it right away. I think she washes it before she's even done with it. So fast, so clean. I'm not that. I'm the guy who knows I'm supposed to wash these dishes, but I kind of walk by like this. Anybody else walk by the dirty dishes just like this? I saw someone point at their husband in the back. I'm not going to name names, but I feel you, my brother. Don't feel bad. I'm right. The preacher is right there with you, and I ain't going to say your name because uh, I love you. Um, but, yeah, I'm the guy who kind of walks by and pretends I don't see it, but I know I've got to deal with it. You know, it doesn't matter how long I pretend it's not there. I'm eventually going to have to deal with those dishes. America kind of has this problem. If we've had, we've, America's had dirty dishes in the sink for a long time, and we haven't dealt with them. And it just starts to stink after a while. America, America's got to wash its dirty dishes at some point. we got to deal with some stuff we don't want to deal with. 
okay? And that even means that preachers like me have got to talk about it. And boy, let me tell you, is it ever uncomfortable at times to talk about this stuff. But, again, more scared of God than I am of y'all. As much as I love y'all and respect y'all, I better do what the Lord had me to do. I don't want to move past this without spending some time on the last phrase in verse 27. He says to do these things and to keep yourself unspotted from the world. That's tough. To keep yourself unspotted from the world. To make a difference in the world while remaining different from the world. To make an impact on society without becoming like that society. Now that's tough. That is really tough, especially in the times in which we live. Man, America's in such a weird and uncomfortable place right now. It's so easy to get caught up in it. And, and even if you love Jesus, you can start, it's easy for us to start sounding just like everybody else. And, and uh, there's Christian folks on every side of every issue, it seems, and Christian folks arguing with each other about this and uh, about that. And we can start to look and sound just like everyone else in the world. And we, we don't want to do that. We want to stay unspotted from the world. Man, when I was growing up, I used to hear people say, well, if you want to get along with someone, don't talk about politics or religion. Did you ever hear that growing up? Say, if you want to get along, don't try not to talk about politics and religion. Very hard to do in 2020 because in America, it seems like politics has become people's religion. People have like a religious devotion almost to, to politics or a political party or political candidates or, or whomever. It's, it's like we got to be so careful about that. Because we can find ourselves, if, we're, if we make politics into our religion, we can, we can find ourselves defending actions and behaviors that, that really don't line up with the Word of God. And that's an uncomfortable position to be in. And I know what you're going to say. Like, hey, the other, the other side, they're worse than our side. They're worse. Have you heard about them? They do this, they do that. Maybe you're right. Maybe the other side is worse. I just want to say this. Here, I'll throw this out there to you. Just remember, Jesus, people, our citizenship is in the kingdom of God first. Now, we need to be good citizens of whatever earthly nation we are in. You should vote. You should be a part of the political process. But just remember this. You're a citizen of heaven first. And America, or wherever you're listening from, second. And we need to just keep that in mind. So, here I am, crazy preacher on the corner of the highway beside Pizza Hut, talking about things is going to get me in trouble. I know that. Some people are going to, I'm going to hear about this sermon. I already know. I've been doing this preaching thing for 20 years now, and I kind of know how this works. Some people are going to say, Michael, you shouldn't have talked about all that. Some people are going to say, you should have talked a lot more about that. I'm not going to make anybody happy today. That's okay. I'm just going to try very hard to say what the Lord would have me to, to say. I don't know how to fix everything, but I do know this. It cannot stay the way it is. It cannot stay the way it is. Jesus' people need to be salt and light in this world. And we need to be careful because there are people who want to make political pawns of us. We're not, polit we are, we're not political pawns. We are children of God. So we just have to be so careful. We need to make a difference in this world without being spotted up by this world. Be the hands and feet of Jesus, not the mouthpiece of any politics. That's our calling. So, probably ticked everybody off. That's okay. I'm going to tell you one feel-good story, okay, to end it. It's hard to do the right thing in this world because it seems so risky. You know, if you, stand, if you speak out on any issue that's important and good and right, somebody is going to jump on you. Or if you try to help somebody, somebody else is going to jump on you. And it gets really old getting jumped on, doesn't it? I get worn out of getting jumped on by somebody because I'm trying to do the right thing. Jesus told this story. He told a story of a man who was traveling on foot. You know, they didn't have cars back then. He was traveling on foot from one town to another. And he was confronted by these robbers who beat him up, took everything he had, and left him for dead on the side of the road. And there he is, dying. Thankfully, somebody comes by. It's a religious leader who comes by. It's a religious leader from Jerusalem. He comes by and he sees the man lying there and he knows the right thing to do. He knows he should stop and help him. And it's not that he doesn't care, seemingly, but he doesn't stop. Why? Because he's afraid 
that if he stops to help this guy, the same people that beat him up will beat him up. That, that someone will attack him too. So it's not that he doesn't care, but he's like, man, I can't get involved in this. And he walks on by and tries not to pay attention. A little while later, another religious guy shows up, a Levite this time. The first one was a priest. This one's a Levite. He's um, kind of a worker in the temple. And he sees the man laying there, and he knows the right thing to do. He knows he should stop and he should help. But he's afraid to because he's thinking, man, if I stop and help this guy, I might be the next one that's targeted. What if those people who beat him up are still around? They'll come and, and beat me up too, and I'd be in the same shape as him. So the, Jesus never says that the man didn't care, but he says he was afraid to stop and help. So he just hurried on past too. And that's kind of the way we are in America right now. You probably see some stuff that's wrong. You see some people who need some help. But we're like, man, if I stop and if I try to help these people, I'm going to get jumped on too. Somebody's going to say mean stuff about me too. I, I'm going to be targeted too. And that's really, that really stinks. You try to do the right thing and people want to beat you up for it. Ever been there? Do the right thing and pay a price. I, I had a preacher friend of mine that used to say, no good deed goes unpunished. It kind of feels that way in this world. So we can feel like those other two guys that just walked by like, hey, I don't want to, you know, I, I, I don't want to get involved because not that I don't care. It's just I don't want to get beat up too. So in the story, one more guy walked by. And this man stopped. We know him as the Good Samaritan, the story of the Good Samaritan, famous story. He, well, he wasn't a religious leader, and to be honest, his theology was probably a little off if he believed as the Samaritans typically believed. His theology was a little off, but he's the one that actually stopped and helped. So James said the pure religion and undefiled is to, well, he says widows and orphans, but talking about helping the vulnerable, it seems like this Samaritan was a little more religious that day than the religious leaders. That's the way I read it. He stopped and he helped. And he didn't do it as a political stunt. He didn't like take a selfie boop, and post it on his Instagram and say, hashtag helping the wounded. He didn't do any of that. He didn't like advocate for reform of safety on the highways or anything. He wasn't doing it to be seen or to make a point or to make any kind of political statement. He was just helping somebody who was in need. He was just helping somebody because it was the right thing to do. And that's why he did it. It was the right thing to do. Man, in this world, no matter what you do, somebody is going to jump your case. Here's what I'm going to leave you with this week. I hope I haven't just ruffled every feather into place, but it's, it is what it is. If you see the right thing to do, do it. I don't have like a nice tight statement like I normally do that here's this memorable thing that rhymes. If you see the right thing to do, do it. There's my advice for you. Ask the Lord to help you and do it. Stand up for someone who needs to be stood up for. Do it. Go visit the widows and orphans in their distress. If there's vulnerable people that you know about, do something for them. Downtrodden people, People without a voice, people without an advocate, do something for them. They might be widows, they might be orphans, uh, they might be elderly or disabled, they, they might come from a people group or a race or, or from an economic part rung of, the, of society. If someone's in need, do what you can to help them. And don't worry so much about what people will say about you. I'm just going to stop right there and I want to pray for us. Heavenly Father, Lord, in this world, it can be such a messy thing helping other people. It can be a real messy thing. Please just give us the courage to do what's right, to do what we can for people, and not worry so much about the consequences. In Jesus' name, amen.